Hey, 4C Divers, welcome to Facebook Live. Thank you for tuning in tonight. It is uh, Tuesday and it is June 22nd, 2021. And we've got Mr. John here, our instructor from 4C. John, say hi to everybody. Hi, everyone. Awesome. We are so excited for tonight's presentation. So make sure you say hello to John. Tell us where you're listening in from. Write it in the comments section. And if you have any questions tonight, also write those in the comments section as well. All right, guys. So you know the drill. If you're enjoying the presentation, we want to know. Give us a thumbs up. Give us a smiley face or give us that heart emoji. We want to know that you're here and you're listening and you're enjoying our presentation tonight. We also have a raffle at the end of our Facebook Live. So you want to make sure to go to the Eventbrite link and register before 645. I'll put it in the comments section if you haven't done it yet, because we are going to be raffling off the SSI digital kit for the uh, Fish ID course. And you have an opportunity, and uh, John's going to tell you a bit later, to use that digital kit to get certified and get that card from SSI. So we're really excited to be raffling that off. Make sure, like I said, go to www.force-e.com, go to the event tab, click on tonight's event. You'll see that Eventbrite link. Type in your name, email, join us back over here and listen into the fun because fish are friends, not food, right, John? That's right. <laughs> All right, guys. So I'm going to turn the tables over here to Mr. John Riker, and he is going to tell us about Fish ID. All right. Let's bring that in. All right. Well, thank you, Nicole, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in. Mm -hmm. um, I've been here part of the 4C team for about a year now um, and uh, moved to South Florida from California a year ago, moved my family down here, uh, really, so we could uh, enjoy the warm tropical waters. I'd uh, been in the cold, chilly California kelp forest, which is beautiful, and plenty of uh, fish out there, too, and life, but uh, it was time for some warm water. So um, just a little bit of background of uh, who I am uh, and why I'm, I'm giving this course to you tonight um, is, number one, I am a university professor. Um, I got my PhD from UC Davis in marine ecology. And uh, so uh, I actually teach this stuff um, for, uh, for a job, teach marine biology and oceanography. And, um, and so I still actually teach uh, online out in California. I also teach at uh, Palm Beach Atlantic University down here in Florida. And I also get to work with the 4C team. So I just love diving. I love uh, exploring the underwater world myself um, and then sharing that with others. So um, this is really part of my love and my passion here. And I hope to be able to share that a little bit with you tonight. My um, The danger in asking a university professor to do this sort of thing is that I'm used to doing two hour lectures, right? And uh, even Zoom lectures, but um, we're, uh, that's not the goal tonight. Uh, tonight, I really want to um, just give you a bit of introduction um, to Fish ID and to give you a little bit more of a framework for how you can understand what you're looking at underwater. Uh, so we're not, the goal tonight is to not make expert fish identifiers out of you, um, but to give you a framework and even kind of a framework for the local fish here. Um, I do think that this framework is something that you can take to other locations as you travel, wherever you go. Um, but we're gonna, of course, focus in on um, where most of, or many of us are at. I also saw in the chat that a lot of you are tuning in from elsewhere. Uh, so, um, but we're gonna focus on some of our local uh, Florida fish species. Another thing I wanna do is to recommend some resources to you. Um, and ultimately my, my last goal, and this is kind of, may sound like a big goal, but it's really to, to transform your dive experience. Uh, one of the things that I, um, I love is to be able to look, uh, to know what uh, we're looking at when we're under there. So uh, if you've ever been on a dive boat or maybe this was yourself, you came up and said, yeah, I saw that fish, you know, that green one, the big one. Um, uh, as you get into fish identification, I, I think you get, get a little bit greater appreciation 
um, knowing what you're looking at. You learn more about the fish behaviors um, and it just becomes more interesting. It opens up a whole new level of diving. Uh, so in, uh, even though maybe a big goal, I, I do hope to, to really enrich your dive experience uh, from here. So um, the first thing that we're gonna uh, talk about is classification. Okay, in order to understand identification, uh, we need to understand how things are classified. So let's just use a general example to begin with. Uh, some of you are probably car people. You know cars, you can drive down the road and uh, point this or that. Um, I'm not with you. I mean, I can go to CarMax and I can find the minivan section, the SUV section, but that's kind of about how much I know cars. Um, but uh, we probably know that there's categories that we put things in, whether that's cars or, or maybe you're into art and you may go to an art museum and you understand the Rembrandts and the Van Goghs. And again, that's not my thing. Um, but we all on some level classify things on an everyday basis. On the bottom of the screen, that is not my closet that's a picture of. Maybe some of you have closets that look like that, but um, uh, the idea is that we uh, classify things by colors, by shapes, by sizes, by similarities, um, and that's exactly what we're gonna do with uh, fish as well. So before we get into it, a couple things that, um, I'm gonna give you a few practical tips. I um, mean, as we start to get into classification, there's a few things that you really just um, uh, need, to, need to know or to need to be able to do. And you're gonna need to get some resources. I'm gonna talk to you about kind of books and stuff in a moment, but the number one resource that I think all of us have is the dive community around us. Um, so whether it's our dive buddies that we have right now or uh, those at, at our dive shops, um, there are incredible people that know the fish life here on our reefs in South Florida. Again, I've only been here for a year. I know my Caribbean fish, but um, I've only been here a year. There's some of you that have been here taking pictures and photographing and diving here for uh, 20 or more years. Um, and our fellow divers are great, um, uh, are great uh, resources for all of us to learn more and more. Um, also, um, some other resources that I think that we should all have, if you're serious about fish identification, um, a couple levels of this. Okay, number one are your dive slates, okay? So everybody, if you're interested in fish ID, and I assume you are if you're on this, uh, uh, on this uh, Facebook Live, um, get one of these dive slates so that you know uh, and can begin looking at some of the, the most common species that we have. This slate will have the common families, the common species. For those of you that are ready to go to the next level, or maybe you're doing some photography, um, that's where you wanna go ahead and get the reef fish identification book. This is an incredible resource that I use all the time. Hey, I'm looking, I have to identify um, uh, the, the fish as I'm looking at them to get down to the species. So you need to have some of these resources uh, as we go, okay? A few other things that I recommend to you as we, um, oh, I missed a slide there. You have to get out diving. Now, this isn't groundbreaking stuff, right? Get the books, get the IDs, and go diving. Um, but hopefully you are diving, you're looking at the fish around you, you're opening up the, the book or the dive slate that you have, um, and you're identifying some things as you go, and then you're diving again. And as you do, you continue to build up your knowledge of what fish you're looking at. Okay, it will go from, I saw that yellow one with stripes, to looking in your book, and the next time you'll go and say, oh, that's a, a grunt, and you're seeing that as you go. So again, simple tips to begin with, but get the resources, including the people around us. Okay, pick up some sort of ID guide. Uh, you can't do this without it. Um, and then dive and look at those resources. Talk to those people and keep getting out there diving, seeing more and more. All right, back into classification. And if you will let me kind of nerd out here a little bit, um, I'll uh, try to keep it just kind of this, this part brief. But we need to know the categories for describing and classifying life. Otherwise, we can't get anywhere. So um, 
we classify life in a scheme that some of you may remember. This may be bringing some nightmares back from high school or college or whatnot. Um, and let me be clear to you, if you graduated uh, college sometime before the year 2000, there's actually a different classification scheme than we had uh, when we were in high school and college. Um, you'll notice a, a term on the top here, category called the domain. Um, there are actually now three large domains of life. So when we look at the great diversity of life that's out there, um, we're trying to just understand and classify this all this life. All of the life on the planet fits into three large categories called domains. Those are uh, a category called archaea, a category called eukarya, and a category called bacteria, which you're probably familiar with. Okay. But the one that we're going to focus on is the one that fish are part of, and that is uh, the eukarya. So if we look at the eukarya, we're going to look at three large groups within that bigger group, and those are the kingdoms. So this includes the kingdom of plants, the kingdom of animals, the kingdom of fungi, and a kingdom, or kind of a pseudo-kingdom, if I can call it that, of the um, prudus. So again, what we want to focus in on tonight are the animals, okay? So among the animals, there are actually 34 phyla. And again, if, if uh, some of you will recognize these terms, others of you, just think of them as big categories, okay? So there are up to 34, and the reason I put a question mark is because classification is always changing um, a little bit. And so currently there's as many as 34 different phyla of animals. We are gonna focus in on the phylum of the chordates, which includes all of the vertebrates. Um, so most of the, uh, or all the animals with a backbone that we think of, those would fit in the phylum chordates. And finally, I'm gonna get talking about fish. So among this classification scheme, there are three large classes of fishes. Now, little side note, fish is actually a general term that refers to the animals that we think of as fish, those that have gills for breathing in water, those that have fins. Um, these is just a general generic term uh, for fish. Um, and also uh, for you English majors out there, I didn't make a typo by saying fishes. Fish, we've always learned, is both the singular and plural for the number of fish. However, when you see this term fishes, it refers to different kinds of species. Okay, so um, three classes of fishes exist. What are those three classes? Well, number one is a rather nasty one that we don't usually dive with, unless sometimes you're diving in uh, rivers around the country. Um, these are the jawless fish the agnatha, they include lamprey and hagfish. I'm not really gonna talk about them anymore. Okay, the next class that we're gonna talk about is of course interesting to many of us, okay? The chondrichthys, um, these are cartilaginous fish, fish that have a skeleton made of cartilage. They include sharks, which we love. Uh, they include the skates and rays, which we love as well. Um, and then the third category, uh, in, of the cartilaginous fish are the rat fishes. Many of those are deep water fish, um, so we don't usually dive with them. They may be of a little interest to us, um, but the large group is the chondrichthys, the cartilaginous fishes. Um, just a side note, there's a subclass, the elasmobranchs, which includes the sharks, the skates, and the rays. The final class of fish are the osteichthys, the bony fishes. Pretty much everything else fits in this category of the bony fishes. Their skeleton is made of bone, okay? And so a great diversity, of course, in fact, uh, among all of the vertebrates, um, fish and bony fishes, to be exact, are the most diverse grouping of organisms, okay? So again, classifying life. There are three large groups of fishes that we wanna learn to understand a little bit more about. Now. We usually don't go around talking about these classes because you don't just say, oh, I saw a bony fish underwater, right? No, we get a little bit more specific. And where we really want to focus, um, where I think is the best category to focus on is the family level. 
Okay, the family are the groupings that we typically can recognize fairly easily and learn to identify more fish. So my pro tip number three is this, okay? Think about fish families, learn some fish families, okay? Don't get too specific, don't get too broad, learn about the fish families. So you'll recognize on this list, and I'm not saying you need to learn kind of the, the fancy name for these fish families, but the common names, things like angel fishes, okay? You'll be able to recognize angel fishes the next time you are uh, diving. Butterfly fishes, damsel fishes. These are just some of the popular reef fish that we see at the Blue Heron Bridge all the time uh, that we say, see out on our reefs off South Florida. And pretty much throughout wherever you find tropical reefs, these are uh, the, some of the most common fish families that you will see. So if you can learn this list, I think I have 10 listed there. If you can learn to recognize um, these fishes, then you will um, get much better at identification. What's pretty cool is that your uh, reef fish identification book um, breaks them down by families. So you can, if you can recognize an angel fish, then you can recognize more uh, specific species or find them more easily uh, in your book, okay? So our tip so far, get some resources, okay? Including some good people around you, some good dive buddies, okay? Um, uh, tip number two, was what was tip number two i'm forgetting now oh dive keep diving okay dive look at your books okay but just keep diving getting out there and three focus on learning your fish families the final one that i'm going to give you is now get specific and when i'm saying get specific i am kind of a little pun there uh thinking about species learning to identify what each of these species are. You'll find that you have some favorites out there and you'll be able to recognize them um, and uh, be able to wow your dive buddies with your, your knowledge of fish identification. But as we get into looking, um, what, what I wanna do now is to kind of break down uh, how it is that you can identify species, how you go from these large groupings of families down into species, okay? So number one is recognizing that every species of fish out there that has been identified has been given a specific name. That name is a two-part name that includes the genus and the species. Now, um, common names are not generally used in science because in different parts of the world, people call uh, different fish by different names. For example, for those of you that are maybe uh, fisher, fishermen or women here in South Florida as well, you would know the dolphin fish, right? A common uh, fish. Well, in Hawaii, we refer to it as the mahi-mahi. In Mexico, we refer to it as the dorado. So when fish are identified and classified, they are all given a species name, which includes both the genus and the species. For example, here we have the Goliath grouper, a local favorite. Okay, the scientific name is Epinephalus it's a jar, okay? And um, let me give you kind of a word of advice, okay? Nobody really knows how to say these names, okay? They're in Latin. And so just say them with confidence and people will think that you know what you're saying. So hopefully I just said it right. But as we look at the name, you'll see these fish belong in the family Epinephelidae. Okay, again, said with confidence. Um, there are 19 species in this family. Okay, I've just pulled out four of them here that you may recognize. We have Epinephalus itajara, the Goliath grouper. Epinephalus striatus is the Nassau grouper. Okay, Micturoperca bonasi is the black grouper, and Micturoperca microlepsis is the gag grouper. Okay, you'll notice that these two have the same genus name. Okay, they are more closely related to each other than they are to other species of grouper because these two are in a different genus, okay? And again, these two are more closely related to each other than these two, uh, than they are to uh, these other ones, okay? We'll come back to identifying these specific species uh, in a moment. But what are some things that are helpful as we try to identify species, okay? Well, number one, it's helpful to describe where they hang out. 
So we know fish hang out on reefs, fish hang out on wrecks. They hang out really anywhere in the water. They hang out on the sand, in the sand, all over. So here's a couple terms for you. Benthic fish refer to bottom dwellers, okay? So if a fish is a benthic fish, it is associated with the bottom, okay? The bottom may be sand or it may be uh, a reef fish. They may live in the sand. They may live in the reef or around the reef. If they are associated with the bottom, we refer to them as benthic species, okay? So here are some of our common examples that we commonly see associated with the bottom. It doesn't mean that we will never see them um, in the water column. It just means that most of their life and most of their form is associated with life on the bottom. Take our frogfish, for example, okay? Some of you have noted that you've seen the frogfish um, in the water column spawning. They will go to the water column to, to spawn, but more commonly, their limbs, their fins are well associated are well formed in order to function on the bottom. Same with this sea robin here, or the short tail, a sharp tail uh, eel. The opposite of benthic is pelagic. These are open water dwellers. So these are fish that are adapted and spend most of their life swimming around in the water column. Okay, so that may be large fish that migrate large distances or they may be some that really just don't associate closely with the bottom, like the schools of spade fish that we all often see. Um, they are uh, more kind of midwater pelagic species. And of course, many of these fish will live somewhere in between those two extremes, benthic and pelagic. Um, and just as a side note, for those that are uh, living close associated with the surface, they're referred to as epi, Okay, surface pelagic, surface dwelling fish. They live in close association with the ocean surface. Okay, so helpful to describe fish, whether they are benthic or pelagic. What are some things that we can look for when IDing fish? Well, here's a list of good things. Okay, looking at their body shape, looking at body patterns, looking at the position and shape of their mouth, okay, looking at the shape of their tail. Um, and finally, we'll look a little bit at behavior. So many of the body shape, body coloration, mouth position, we refer to these as morphological characteristics. They're body characteristics. And if you open one of these ID books, you'll see their description refers to different types of shapes. So let's do a little anatomy review for us, okay? So when you're looking at a fish, some of the common characteristics, of course they have fins. Um, there's different terms for the fins that we see um, on the fish, okay? So the dorsal fin is the back fin, okay? The caudal fin is the tail fin. And also there's something called the caudal peduncle. This is where uh, the tail uh, meets the fish. And this is good to point out because Many fish will have different coloration there, or they'll actually have a, the presence or absence of a keel on there that helps them as they maneuver. So recognizing the caudal peduncle refers to where the tail connects to the body, okay? We have the anal fin, which is located behind the anus of the fish on the underside. So usually towards the rear here. Uh, and then we have the pectoral and the pelvic fins. So the way I like to remember these is we know where our pectoral muscles are, our pecs, our chest muscles, are, and we know where our pelvis is, okay, by our hip at the top of our leg. So the pelvis is below the pectorals, and that's how it is with the fish. The pectoral fins are higher, usually on the side of the gill opening here. Um, the pelvic fin is going to be on the bottom. So we'll see in several fish, uh, especially bottom dwelling fish, that these fins can be very specifically adapted. So very helpful when we are looking at identifying different species. The next thing to consider is general body shape. Okay, so here's just a few uh, body shapes that we may see um, from disc to oval shape and you can see uh, how our materials here kind of present them uh, as actual shapes, elongated 
our longer fish and regular is kind of what we stereotypically think of as, as a fish. Uh, this would be typical of snapper and grouper, uh, sea bass um, and the like. But there's other uh, examples here that we may have eel-like, which are extremely elongated. Uh, we'll have flattened fish similar to uh, flounder and then a lot of odd shapes as well. Well, let's start just by looking at some of the, these more common body shapes that we see here. And many fish are gonna have very characteristic. Uh, for example, okay, um, this is a butterfly fish in our top right corner here. Okay, has a very uh, characteristic disc type shape, okay, almost round body pattern. The box fish or the trunk fish, also similar to a cowfish, um, have a very bony structure and they're very boxy, hence the name box fish. Um, down here at the bottom, we have a a uh, coronet fish or a trumpet fish. Um, they have different tails, but their bodies and their mouths look very similar. So they're very elongated fish. A few more examples. Um, and these are, I should mention that many of these uh, photographs have come from our local uh, 4C dive pros um, and some of our local divers that are actually out here uh, photographing uh, all the time. So here we have a fringed file fish, um, a blue angel fish, okay, a stoplight parrot fish. Notice kind of the nice big oval, almost football shape uh, of the parrot fish, okay, the doctor fish. And so these are shapes that you will commonly see um, out on our reefs here. And so if you can learn, okay, the general shape of an angel fish, okay, notice kind of the oval pattern here. Okay, elongated um, fins uh, in the dorsal and the anal fin here, um, and a very typical uh, caudal fin here. A very characteristic shape of an angelfish. Same thing with a parrotfish. Parrotfish are called parrotfish because they have a uh, mouth here, almost like a parrot's beak that they go and they chew on coral. And interesting fact is they chew that coral uh, and chew the algae off the coral. They actually uh, poop out nice clean sand. Um, and so we're very thankful for uh, parrotfish. Most of the beaches that we enjoy uh, may have originated from uh, parrotfish poop. Uh, so, um, and so a few common examples in their common shapes. Now we are very fortunate at the Blue Heron Bridge to have a, a number of odd shaped fish. And these, the odd shaped fish are actually much easier to identify than maybe some of the more commonly shaped fish. So I recommend rather than trying to figure out differences between snapper and grunts, um, get to know some of these odd shaped fish that we see very often, such as our uh, batfish here. Notice on this batfish um, that these are actually the pelvic fins and the pectoral fins that are adapted for walking motion, some of the very interesting adaptations uh, that we see. Um, of course, other uh, charismatic uh, fish, odd shapes that we recognize immediately, right? Our frogfish, our seahorse, our stargazer. Here's that coronet fish um, once again. Okay, notice very elongated. And here is a file fish. Couple photographs from uh, Brenda Hill, who is uh, one of our great photographers uh, at the Blue Heron Bridge and beyond. Few other kind of odd shaped individuals that, that you'll see. Um, these are uh, flying gonards, okay, a pair of them that were taken there. And here's an interesting one that I just photographed yesterday, actually. Um, this is not a ray, this is a guitar fish. Um, which again, what makes it a guitar fish versus a ray? A stingray, okay, I don't have a picture to put side by side, but it's gonna have a, more of a, di a large square diamond shape to it um, or a rounded shape where the guitar fish is gonna be a little bit more elongated. It also has a tail that is more similar to a shark than your typical uh, stingray. So again, small things that you see in their morphology that you can learn to identify. Okay, what are some other things? Okay, markings and body patterns. So coloration, right? A great thing to be able to identify with. Um, there are many different designs out there. 
Uh, many prey and predator use these to be able to camouflage themselves okay, against the bottom or in the water column. Uh, prey will use them to, uh, to um, disorient their predators so they don't know which end is up, which uh, is the front of the body. Uh, so they might have an eye spot on the back of the body, things like that. However, when it comes to identification, you need to be cautious about using color and size. There are many fish, uh, such as the stoplight parrotfish, that are notorious for changing color pattern as they grow and as they mature. Um, in fact, some of them can, can change three or four times throughout their lifetime. So here we have a juvenile stoplight parrotfish. Okay, how do you know it's a parrotfish? Okay, we have this nice oval football shape, a what we call a lunate tail, which I'll show you in a moment, and a mouth similar to a parrot, okay, with that beak. You'll often see them uh, travel around chewing on algae on the reef. This is an adult mature stoplight parrotfish. Notice the drastic color change, okay? Um, they change color, and if we were to look at a very immature juvenile, we would see that they would be even different uh, in their prior stage as well. So you have to be cautious about uh, just looking at color and patterns. Let me give you a few more examples because these are common here on our reefs. And in fact, at the Blue Heron Bridge, we see a lot of juveniles um, because it's a great nursery area. And those larvae actually float in on the Gulf Stream, come in the Lake Worth Inlet. Okay, those little larval fishes grow up to juveniles and to um, later stage juveniles. And then when they grow into adults, they make their way back out to the reefs so we can see them out there. So we're gonna see a lot of juveniles at a place like the Blue Heron Bridge or some of our other inshore areas, while we'll see adults more out on the reefs offshore. So here, for example, is a high hat, okay, uh, which is in the drum family. And you'll notice, okay, similar color patterns, but drastic changes in the size and shapes of the fins and the color patterns change as well. Um, here is a trunk fish, okay? Again, notice the boxy shape. Uh, we can see even as they grow through their juvenile stages that they have um, different color patterns and they may change. And as they reach adult stage, they may look very different than what they did as a juvenile. Okay. So what's nice is that your fish ID guides are, and even your dive slates are often going to show you the juveniles um, as well as the mature stage. So you can start making those connections as well. One more example for you. Here's the French angelfish. Okay. Again, notice the shape of the angelfish, large extension on the dorsal fin, large uh, extension on the anal fin. Okay. Very characteristic. Uh, oval shape here. Um, and uh, if we were to look at the shapes of the juveniles, we would see uh, their shape is very similar, but their color pattern changes quite a bit. And we see all of these stages uh, regularly in our waters here. Also to be aware of is that some fish will look alike, but even though their colors look the same, uh, they have very different features. So what we're getting at here is don't just look at colors and patterns. You need to look at some other identifiers as well. So here's similar color pattern, but notice the difference in the dorsal fin. One long dorsal fin here. Okay, we have two separate dorsal fins on this goatfish down here. This goatfish actually has some extensions here um, also that it uses for feeding because it's a benthic fish. And so it feeds along the bottom using what are called barbells. Okay, also different tail shapes as well. Okay, so mouth position and shape is another identifier that we can use. Okay, so you're familiar with many fish that have very different mouth patterns. Um, usually, this also gives us hints into their behavior and where they, uh, where they feed, right? Their mouth will be well adapted to how they feed. So here is a characteristic mouth of a grouper. A grouper are what we call gulpers. They open this big mouth and it actually kind of creates a suction so that whatever the small fish that's around them actually gets sucked right into their mouth. So very big gape to their mouth. 
um, combine, uh, compare that to a tubular mouth that we see in uh, a, many of the butterfly fish or uh, in seahorses as well, which shows us that they're feeding on small algae uh, on the reef or small plankton perhaps, um, rather than kind of this big old mouth that a grouper has. Uh, sharks uh, typically have a subterminal mouth, okay, which means that it's located on the other side. Okay? Um, and as I just pointed out in that goat fish, here are some barbells. If you see barbells, uh, it's a hint that they are feeding on the bottom because they use those as uh, sensory organs to sense things moving around uh, in the sand so that they can uh, get at it. Okay, so again, some of our common examples uh, that we see around here. So remember that mouth shape um, is very characteristic of behavior and can help in identification. Okay, the final thing that we're gonna look at as far as a shape of fish are, uh, as Nicole put into this PowerPoint, fish butts or tail shape. Okay, I already referred, referred to these a couple times, but uh, you'll notice on fish that they have very different tail shapes. A lunate looks like this half, uh, half moon, and we've looked at some examples of those already. Truncate, okay, basically is a straight down tail. That was familiar in the angelfish that we looked at. A uh, fork tail, we saw that example in the goatfish. Okay, comparing the fork tail versus the lunate tail, and we see some other examples as well. And again, as you are looking out there as fish, you'll notice these uh, differences, and they'll be described that way in your ID book. All right, let me kind of bring home this getting more specific. Um, and we've just got a few more minutes here and then I hope that you have some questions uh, that we'll be able to, to answer through as well. So um, let me get back to how is it that we take our understanding of, okay, we have identified a family of fish because we're generally familiar with maybe angel fish or surgeon fish or grouper. We know it's a grouper, okay, we've gone to our Reef fish ID book, okay, we've opened it up and we look at, okay, heavy body, large lips. We found, okay, our groupers here. Now, how do I determine which species this is? Is this a black grouper or a gag grouper? They look very similar and often when we're diving, okay, right, we don't have the, we're not just looking at pictures, we're not holding it in our hand, we're looking at a moving object. How do we identify that? Well, what's nice about these ID books is if we move forward and we find the page on our groupers, okay, we can find images that look similar and then notice what it does here. It points out very specific features that are characteristic of this species. So uh, what we'll notice here is on the grouper or on the black grouper, I'm sorry, they're both grouper, right? Um, they point out that there are light colorations on both the pectoral fins and on the caudal fin. And also that there's a characteristic bar shape, which again, a little bit hard to see in this picture. Um, but in this one, we see again that there is no light shape at the end of the tail here. And there's a characteristic eye pattern that we can pick out here. So now you're getting into fine tuning uh, your species and identifying them. And once you learn, okay, if you really want to learn the difference in the grouper, okay, you'll come back here and you'll pay attention to these specific characteristics. And I, I trust you, once you see these and then you go out diving, you will recognize these marks and you'll be able to come back to the surface and say, did you see that gag grouper? And your buddy will say, I saw a grouper. I didn't know what kind it was. So um, you'll key into specific features of the different species and begin to determine uh, which is which, even while you're diving underwater. A final piece to it, which really gets to be fun because um, once you know some of the species, you can look at some of their characteristic behaviors. So for example, parrotfish will often on their night dives, um, they will kind of make a cocoon for themselves and lay still on the reef. So when you're out there on a night dive, if you can identify parafish, you'll start to see that behavior. 
Or another characteristic that I told you is that they like to go around munching on the algae on reefs and poop out sand. And you'll begin to see next time you're going out diving and that school of parafish goes by, you'll see them pooping out sand. and You'll be thankful for our beaches. Okay. Another thing that you may uh, be able to use some of those behaviors to help with your identification. For example, the group of, uh, for example, some of you may be familiar with the sailfin blennies. Uh, sailfin blennies, they will, uh, when they see you, they'll come out of their hole. They'll kind of lift up their fin. Some of you as divers bring a mirror along as well. I know it kind of makes them get really amped up. Um, but if you can recognize that sailfin blenny, then you can begin to recognize some of their behaviors uh, as well, which really begins to open up the underwater experience. Not only are you just kind of passing by all this cool living stuff, you're recognizing how they interact with each other. You're recognizing their behaviors. And that's when I really think it starts to get uh, awesome when you understand uh, what they're doing and recognize what it is you're looking at. So let me kind of summarize here, practical tips and next steps that I gave you, okay? If you wanna get into fish ID, gotta get some resources. Number one, okay, get around some good divers in the area. Uh, photographers are awesome because they're fine tuning in and they're bringing back still photos to be able to identify those very real details. So um, pick up, either a dive slate or that reef fish identification uh, book um, so that you can really um, begin to understand what you're looking at. Okay. Get out of a dive. Look at that. Look at it before a dive. Go back in and you'll recognize some of those species. I would really recommend uh, that you pick up um, some sort of camera. Okay. If you're not ready to make the big jump to become a photo pro, uh, get a GoPro. Okay. That you can take out there with you. Um, my GoPro Hero 9 gets great footage, put a macro lens on it, and some of the pictures that you're looking at, the PowerPoint, um, were from uh, that camera. And so if you can bring those memories home, or even if you just have video, uh, then you can do your identification after. You can sit down with your book and you, you can share with each other, oh, what was that gray fi green fish? I have it on video. Let's take a look at it. Let's identify it. The next time we'll know. Um, and have a dive slate where maybe you'll be able to write down uh, some details as well about behaviors, what you're noticing, or keep track of the fish that you're recognizing. And I guarantee that you'll begin to recognize more and more. Okay. Of course, you got to go diving. Get out there as often as you can. Uh, we're coming into summer right now, beautiful conditions offshore, inshore. Get out and dive. Um, get intentional about identifying fish. Remember, think fish families. Learn those top 10 fish families, okay? The ones that we see all the time so that at least you'll be able to recognize, okay, I saw an angel fish. Now I'm gonna learn what kind of angel fish. And from there, you can get specific. Take some of those uh, characteristics that we looked at tonight, get more specific in your ID book. Uh, and here, here's what I'm gonna give you as a task to do, okay? Write down your top 10 species. Okay, species, okay? Which ones do you love seeing, okay? And if you don't know what it is, begin to recognize. Maybe you love those sharp-nosed puffers that are out there. Maybe you love the French angel fish. Maybe you love the schools of spade fish. What are your top 10? Some of you could rattle it off right away. Maybe even put your top one or two in the chat right now uh, so we can see what it is as well. But make a list. Once you have that list of top 10, keep adding to it. You'll be amazed at how your knowledge uh, increases in fish identification. And if you want more, of course, we're here. Um, like I said, I'm a 4C uh, instructor. I love getting out there. This is kind of my passion that I love to share with people. I teach all the ecology specialties. Um, and I know we have a special uh, deal coming up for fish ID. Um, and not just doing it on the computer, but getting out and diving together. So I would love to dive with you. Um, I think maybe Nicole is going to be able to share uh, those times with us. Um, but before I kind of turn it back over to her, uh, I just want to thank some of those photo pros uh, that we featured some of their, we didn't, weren't able to give photo credit to every picture as we were making the PowerPoint, but our 4C pros, okay, Nicole Ordway, uh, Jordan Harrison, Mark Kosserin, we had Jason Spitz and Monica 
uh, Shandell, and uh, two of uh, our favorite photographers out of the bridge, Brenda Hill and Allison Van Sickle. Thank you guys for letting us use your pictures. Um, hopefully this was helpful, and I hope I get to dive with you real soon. Nicole, you there? Okay. okay. Hi, everybody. How was that, you guys? Awesome. Great. We've got some questions coming in. And just um, a, a note, there are some organizations that are around. If you guys want to get more involved in Fish ID and also doing some fish um, surveys, um, I, I don't remember if you mentioned the reef surveys, John. Do you know much I about that? No. Okay. So down in the Key Largo area, there's an um, organization, REEF, R-E-E-F, and they do roving fish surveys. And if you want more information about that, you can contact me at info at forestashy.com. I can get you info. But here in our backyard, we actually have the Palm Beach County Reef Research Team. And they have a team that goes out and they also do fish surveys up in the Palm Beach County area. And if you want more information, um, one of their research team members, Sherry Kraft, if you look in the comment section, she added the uh, URL. And they also have a great website that shows photos of how to study for fish ID. So if you're interested in more ways to get involved and maybe get out there and do some surveys of fish and you guys think you're confident in your skills of your, of your ID skills, um, you can go ahead and get involved and Maybe you might feel that way after you take a class with John. So I did. That's right, add, we, we can all learn to identify fish. Yeah. So I we added the link in the comments section, you guys, for his fish ID course. Um, that is going to be July 6th and July 10th. So if you want to get in on this course, uh, all you got to do is to click on that link um, and you can register. The July 6th is going to be a um, classroom session followed by a dive at the Blue Heron Bridge. Or the July 10th will be a classroom session followed by an afternoon trip um, to tank dive on a boat in Palm Beach County. So, um, and that's all going to be taught by the wonderful John that gave you your presentation. So, obviously, if you enjoyed and you want to learn more from him, that is the way to go. All right, guys. So, here's the questions coming in. Um, they wanted to know, are classifications the same for freshwater fishes? So um, typically, again, that family level, um, there are uh, some families that you can find in both fresh and, um, and salt water. Um, however, most of the freshwater families are gonna be different unique families at the family level. So if you go up higher in classification to order and of, of course to, um, to classes, uh, you have both freshwater and saltwater, but at the family level, um, they're generally unique uh, freshwater families and unique saltwater. Okay, um, so you mentioned going out there with your cameras, and a couple of people are maybe new to diving, um, or maybe some uh, photographers that are a little bit um, more advanced mm -hmm. and they have more stuff like strobes on their cameras. What is the best practices with fish and pho photography with fish? Yeah, well, um, just kind of on a practical level, um, and there might be some photo pros that can, you know, talk more about strobes. And Nicole, maybe you could add a little bit more into that as well, because uh, I basically go, you know, GoPro and uh, big blue light on there. Uh, but um, I think buoyancy is is key. Um, you want to be careful that you're not landing on anything coral, you know, which you're dangerous mm -hmm. to, or uh, something that uh, may be dangerous to you. So definitely I would say, you know, watch your buoyancy. Um, also be considerate with those lights and those, uh, those uh, strobes as well. Um, you don't want to take, for example, yesterday I was out there, uh, not with a fish, but with an octopus, uh, and I was shining on my video light, and I could tell it was changing coloration, getting a little disturbed maybe. So I just decided, you know what, I may not get the best shot right now, but I, you know, I'll, I'll get something a little bit darker and uh, try not to disturb the life. So um, things that I, I think in the question here, it talks about an eel, for example. You have to be aware of what could come out at you and what 
is not going to, you know, what is um, more going to move away from you. So something like an eel, you might use more of a, um, you know, GoPro, you know, extension pole uh, to be able to get a little bit closer, give yourself a little distance. But again, I'd say, you know, be considerate to the animals as you take your photography. And most of the time, um, if they don't want to be with you, they'll disappear. <laughs> so. That is true. And uh, I am huge at getting fish butts on picture. <laughs> there you go. Falling around a fish and you basically will be ready and you're ready to take the photo and then boom, it changes position on you and then it's a fish butt. Well, you know. Yeah, that can be very helpful for identification. Exactly. Learn, so. <laughs> so don't get, a, I actually was looking for photos of fish butts that I might have had and it was hard <laughs> to find them because I usually delete them, but I need to keep them so that I can use them for ID slides. <laughs> um, another thing that people use, especially at the Blue Heron Bridge, um, they use a thing called a muck stick. Um, it's basically, we saw them here at 4C. I didn't grab one to show you guys, but it's basically a long pole with a handle and like some way to attach it. And if you want, you can use that to steady yourself to take the picture. So that way you're not putting your hand or um, anything, your body down onto the substrate there. And again, you find some of these animals that live within three feet of the water's edge there and you don't want to go crashing down on them. So we can use things like muck sticks or if you don't have muck stick, I always tell people pointer fingers. Uh, don't put your hands down. Use a pointer finger if you need to touch the substrate. So... Um, uh, so it, there's interesting, um, uh, that came in, Sherry said, beware of the damselfish. Um, John, I actually have a funny story about damselfish. So we, this goes back to, um, trying to ID something from its behavior and a, a damselfish will actually, um, be more of a threat to you underwater than I think a shark or a barracuda. And the reason why I say that is because damselfish will lay their eggs into these, uh, lay onto rocks, onto the reef. And when you're cruising around and you get too close, they actually come out. And I've had them like nip at my fingers, nip at my mask if I get too close to them because they're protecting their, their eggs. And I actually, when I worked in Hawaii, there was a statue. It was a Buddha statue at a dive site called Coco Craters. And... People like I would laugh because people would go up to the statue to try and take a picture and this damselfish would attack it. And I just thought it was so funny because uh, nor normally people are like, oh, barracudas and sharks, they're going to eat me. And I'm like, no, the damselfish will. So and also, Gary, yes, the trigger fish yes. will also <laughs> hit you as well. So you kind of have to be careful of those two. But uh, normally fish aren't going to come at you. So for photography reasons, um, like you said. Stay your distance, um, and if you can, uh, you know, use that focus button uh, to get that photo, or like I said, uh, stay back and just get that nice reef shot, and he have, the fish ends up being in the shot. Um, also, uh, some other people are chiming in that there's some great fish ID sites uh, the Smithsonian has, and they put the in the link in the um, comment section there. So if you guys are interested, you can find out more about fish um, but again, sometimes it's easier to just take it from one of our local dive instructors, hence why we've created the fish ID course, um, because they're going to take you out on that dive and they're going to be able to point at things and talk to you about things. I can't even tell you how many times that I take people diving and I point stuff out and I always go, okay, Nicole, tell them back on the boat what that is. And I get back on the boat and we like start talking about like how hungry you are or you know, we can't wait to take a shower or something. We get back in and it's like, oh, no, okay. So I'm on the dive and I'm like, okay, I got to remember. I got to tell them about the fish that I saw on the first dive and now the second dive. And then we get back on and it's like, oh, man. And so usually that's when you go. This is the best time to learn about Fish ID with your dive buddies. That's when you guys go find a nice lunch spot or a dinner spot and you sit down, you fill out your log books and you can go around and talk about the fish you saw. And the SSI app, actually has in the app itself all the animals that you encountered. So you can go through and log the animals that you see that were interesting to you. So it's a very cool thing. And, and the SSI course has really great graphics. So it's going to be a pleasure if you take that class because it's going to be super easy for you to understand the information and get that certification with 4C's instructor, John. So <laughs> if you guys want to know more about this class, like I said, it's in the comment section. And 
here it is. It's on our website. There it is. Uh, like if you look at the drop down menu, you have the options of check, clicking on July 6th for the Blue Heron Bridge or July 10th for the boat dive. And uh, that's where you're going to find that information. So, all right. So you guys want to know who's going to get a free digital kit. Not the full course, just the digital kit. We're going to raffle that off. So let me go ahead and pull that up. All right, guys, so I picked everybody's names off of the Eventbrite list. There they all are. Okay, here we go. We're going to pick at random. Who is our lucky winner? Da -da 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 -da. Our lucky winner is Dave. Dave, you are the winner of our Fish ID digital kit mm -hmm. that you can use to go and take the class with um, – our instructor. Now, if you are not here in South Florida or you're not planning to travel to the South Florida area and you can't get um, into a fish ID course, that's okay. You can still get the certification. Um, the dives are like the icing on the cake because you get to go apply all the um, fish ID in person, but you can do this via Zoom. So if you want, we can set up with either myself or John and you can do the digital course and then we can do um, the Zoom call if you're not here locally. So just to let you guys know that even if you can't go for a dive, you can still take the course. All right. So, guys, I have a special surprise. We have this Friday, if you're local, this Friday, we have Lisa from Stoked on Salt who does all of our paint nights. She is doing a paint night with our um, – what do you call this? <laughs> lighthouse, our lighthouse uh, paint night. And we're going to raffle off one of the spots for our paint night. So you guys ready? Here we go. Let's see who our winner is. Da -da 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 and our winner for paint night, Jose, Jose Horzis. Okay, you get to come to paint night. If you're not local, then what we can do is we can talk about maybe mailing the paint kit to you and you can paint it on your own maybe you can zoom in that night and uh we can paint it all together but hopefully you can come to the event jose we will get in contact with you via email all right so that is it and it looks like everybody got their questions answered so thank you guys all for tuning in we appreciate it we're looking forward to some more facebook events soon so, John, thank you for your time and your wisdom. We appreciate it. It was a great presentation about fish. Everybody's writing in, and we are excited. So let's go diving, guys. See ya.